Other than the Colosseum in Rome, one of the largest arenas constructed for the games is in Pompeii. It is the oldest surviving amphitheater in the world. This inscription records the building of this amphitheater in 80 BC, and it's the earliest we have. At the time, they hadn't yet invented the word amphitheater, and they call it a spectacle, spectacula. And the inscription says, Quinctius Valgus and Marcus Porcius, the two top magistrates, built it for the colony as a spectacle, and they dedicated it to their fellow colonists in perpetuity. As was the case with the funeral games, there were personal and political motives for local leaders to sponsor spectacles. And of course, the payoff for them was that it became part of their legacy to their town. Particularly in a pre-Christian culture where there's no guarantee of an afterlife, it's terribly important to do something now for which you can make certain that you get remembered. Evidence of this can still be found on the ancient grave sites in Pompeii. In the street of tombs outside Pompeii, you can still see the link that existed between gladiatorial games and funerals. On them, you could find depicted the gladiatorial games that were fought during their funerals. The beating heart of Rome is not the marble of the Senate, it's the sand of the Colosseum. You bring them death, and they will love him for it. Emperors kept the population of Rome happy by putting on these games. It is a way of keeping you away from the more important issues. But on the other hand, it becomes part of its own political system. To give you an idea of the enduring popularity of the games and the demand for their existence, these spectacles flourished in the empire for almost 700 years, from 264 BC to 400 AD. A lucky spectator attending the events could expect beast hunts in the morning with exotic animals from around the world, public executions at noon, and the highly anticipated gladiatorial battles in the afternoon. You don't just have the games, you have uh, all sorts of ceremonial attached to it. You have a great big procession when all the gladiators dress up in their finest rig. You have a band, music playing, uh, processing down the streets, arriving in the amphitheater. And in the gate, they would go around the arena several times in parade. They would have a warm-up session. And then after that, they would uh, file in front of the emperor sitting in his box, and then they would declare how they wish to fight, either to the first wound or to the death. It's essential to have as much variety as possible in the games. You don't just want gladiators. You also have acrobats, tightrope walkers. You, you then cross over between different types. You see if you can get elephants to do tightrope walking. And in 63 AD, a new attraction was added to the games. There were female gladiators. They were regarded as an absolutely special treat. I mean, they're sufficiently rare that you would advertise them up front as something spectacular that you were going to have in the show. Part of the interest, of course, would be that they would fight with at least one breast bare. Uh, and you obviously would go partially to see very attractive women in very scanty clothes fighting with each other. The Romans wouldn't have wanted to see a woman fighting a man because it would be an unequal combat and there would be no fun in that. These unusual combatants, such as Amazonia and Achillea, remained in vogue for more than a century and a half before Emperor Septimus Severus had all female gladiators banned in the year 200. Advertising was important in ancient times. Filling the Colosseum was no problem, but in the outer provinces, attracting enough people to fill a 20,000-seat arena, like this in Pompeii, was a challenge. The entire population of Pompeii was only 10,000. This is the facade of a house that's on the main street of Pompeii, and originally it was absolutely covered with advertisements for games. There will be a procession, a pompa, a venatio, a beast hunt. There will be awnings over the amphitheater, vela there will be a special kind of beast that leaps upon people who wear turquoise. Also, town criers were used, and a common practice was to advertise on tombs. This, in Pompeii, announced upcoming games that would have 20 pairs of gladiators. In one well-advertised contest in 59 AD, a bloody riot broke out between the citizens of Pompeii and the neighboring town of New Syria.
because of this incident depicted in this famous fresco now in naples all future games were banned in pompeii so why were the games so popular in addition to the thrill of watching blood sports the average person could sit in the same building as his local leader in rome this meant the emperor himself they want to know what's the character of this guy is he actually a responsible sort of man who ought to be an emperor or is he a beast has he got cruelty built into him is he enjoying it too much the violence was obviously part of the attraction and we can tell that from so many images which show actual flow of blood and wounds gushing and so on mosaics that sponsors put on their floors to demonstrate to their clients that they had sponsored this magnificent spectacle and after one bite, Satyrus was so drenched with blood that as he came away, the mob roared and witnessed to the second baptism. You have taken a good bath! This was the traditional cry with which an audience greeted the flow of blood. Perpetua. The popularity of seeing death, watching death, is a very, very curious phenomenon. Remember that in the ancient world, people lived with death all around them all the time. It was a very violent world. Your life was very short. There were no pain-killing medicines. You lived a very violent, difficult existence. So watching gladiatorial fights was, in a way, watching it happen to somebody else instead of to you. Blood sports meant more to the Romans than watching brutal killings. There was also a great fascination with the different armor and weapons of the gladiators and how well they stood up against each other. You could have a Retiarius who was very vulnerable because he had no armor at all, uh, except for a very small shoulder guard. And he was pitted against a heavily armed gladiator who was virtually impregnable, but of course weighed down by his armor so he couldn't have the mobility that the Retiarius had. The Retiarius, or netman, carried a trident, a dagger, and a net with edges that were weighed down with metal balls like a fishnet. His likely opponent would be a Mermillo gladiator, sometimes referred to as a fishman, because his processional helmet had a fish on it. These two types were representative of the two major categories of gladiators. There were the Paramulati, who had small shields and light armor, and the Scutati, who had big, heavy shields and much armor. Within these categories were gladiators that fought with a very specific style and dress based on nations the Romans had conquered in battle. Also, you could fight on horseback, and those are the Andabati, who uh, would go into the arena with a blindfold on themselves and on the horse, and they would just go at each other, whacking right and left, and waiting to see which bit they chopped off. The most common encounter was a simple duel between two gladiators. There's evidence that amphitheater bands were present to play music to match the mood of the match, almost like a music score for a feature film. A top-ranked gladiator would rarely ever face a foe of equal skill. The most popular stars fought only on rare and important occasions, anywhere from one to five times a year. Gladiators are highly trained professionals. You have to pay a very substantial fine if you get the gladiator hurt. We get a figure as much as 50 times the rental price. There's a controversy about how many gladiators actually died fighting in the amphitheater. Some people would put the figure as high as 50%. I prefer a figure somewhere between 5 and 10%. It is a fact that gladiators did die. What is not known is the exact manner in which a gladiator was ordered to kill his opponent. Well, we know that when a gladiator had acknowledged defeat, the umpire would appeal to the spectators for a signal as to whether they believed the gladiator deserved a reprieve or whether he had not fought well enough and must therefore be dispatched. If the crowd approved of the way he fought, uh, they would uh, yell, Missa, Missa, he's dismissed, he, he's free. If instead they did not approve of the way he fought, they would yell, Yugula, Yugula, get him in the jugular vein. The person who has the final decision on life and death is the editor of the games, the man who's put them on. In many cases, that was the emperor himself. We know for sure that when the gladiator is defeated and asks to be let off, he, the sign of surrender is putting up a finger or a hand. The literary sources describe the gesture 
that the man who's giving the games make and they say pressing his thumb or turning his thumb was it thumbs up means you're all right or was it the other way around and what happens is historically a decision is made by filmmakers and the thumbs up sign comes out of a filmmaker's picture of the Roman world, which then becomes a universal sign for OK. Occasionally, a gladiator was finished off by a man he had previously spared. There is an epitaph to a fallen gladiator in which he advised those who came after him to beware. It read, take warning from my fate, give no quarter, whoever the fallen may be. And in many cases, a gladiator uh, who wanted to go out with dignity, who wanted to go out with courage, would simply tilt his head back and expose his jugular vein for this slice. Other times they would be stabbed. Uh, and then the winning gladiator would put his foot on top of the body of the one he had just uh, conquered. Another spectacle which drew big crowds was the beast hunt, featuring wild animals from all reaches of the Roman Empire. The animals were stalked by professional hunters called venatores. In many ways, the amphitheater was a universal zoo. Uh, there was no way the average Roman could get over to North Africa and see a crocodile for real or rhinoceros or something, but you could see these in the amphitheater and there was a tremendous interest in how they worked, how the animals actually behaved, how fast they could run. A wide variety of animals were brought in. We also have zoos outside of Rome specifically for fierce animals where they would be raised and so you'd have your leopards, your lions, clearly gazelles were very popular, ostriches were very popular, in fact some animals would reappear from entertainment to entertainment. We know that there were particularly ferocious bears who people would come to see, and they would have names like fierce, nasty, death, etc. The other events of the day would include public executions of condemned prisoners and Christians. All these public displays served a common purpose for the Romans. We look at the conflict between man and beast and think about how this represents a control over nature. And then, of course, when we look at the execution of criminals, what you see there is, again, society taking on its enemies. And the totality of the display, the control over nature, the control over your enemies, the valor of the combatants, is what seems to have excited the Romans. We know that um, execution in antiquity was always public, partly for deterrent purposes, uh, partly so that the public could see that proper retribution was being uh, taken. The total carnage of humans and animals was staggering. On the opening day of the Colosseum, it was reported that 5,000 beasts were disposed of with the right degree of cruelty. And what of the gladiator? How must it feel as one is about to enter an arena with 50 to 80,000 people all there to witness the fight for life or death? There's got to be a tremendous amount of adrenaline running through your veins as you step out there and face the person. And of course, there every once in a while, people completely lose it and run away. It was quite common for prisoners to commit suicide rather than face certain death by sword or beast. Not for fear of death, but for the humiliation of being killed as a form of entertainment. The games took a quantum leap in size, scale, and savagery when gladiators took to the sands of the house of death. 